So welcome, Iris. Thanks for joining this workshop. Uh, this is a squad leaders um, AMA with Iris Nevins. Um, she's someone who's been with Breaking Into Startups since the beginning. Um, she's also uh, the, the chief editor, editor-in-chief of the publication that Career Karma has. So on her free time outside of coding, Iris is also a writer. And uh, if anyone wants to share their stories on our publication, you should definitely reach out to Iris and connect with her. But without further ado, I want to say welcome, Iris. Uh, thanks a lot for joining. Hi, y'all. Hi, everybody. Oh, this thanks is so for sharing awesome. your time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's my pleasure. Um, so let me do like a quick summary of my background. Um, I was a teacher before, um, and I was also doing like social justice work on the side. And my social justice work led me to develop an interest in technology um, and wanting to figure out how to build technology for um, activists. And so I kind of went down the rabbit hole, eventually realized that if I like went into software development full time, I'm, I could actually make a lot more money than I was making as a teacher and like live a different type of life. So I was like, you know what, let me do this, not just so I could build apps for activists, but so that I could, you know, like um, just create a better life for myself um, and build wealth as well, which is really important to me. Um, and so I spent about six months um, doing online tutorials and teaching myself and then i enrolled in a boot camp in san francisco um i went to dev boot camp which is the original coding boot camp um i was actually in their last cohort they shut down right after i finished but um that was a really cool experience and then afterwards i um you know i got right i got straight to my job hunt i took it really seriously i had actually planned everything out ahead of time so by the time I had graduated, I already had a bunch of um, things like in process. I had people who I'd already started talking to. Um, and so I was quickly able to start doing interviews. And within about two months, I was offered a job at MailChimp. Um, I got my second offer about a week later at, from Reddit. Um, at that point, I dropped out of all my other processes and um, I negotiated between the two and eventually went with MailChimp. Uh, I've been on MailChimp now for a little over a year and um, and it's just, it's been a great journey. That's my summary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks, Iris. And you can definitely hear more about uh, Iris's story on the podcast and we have a YouTube video of Iris just literally sharing the whole process from the very beginning. But this is... This is a chance for people who are on the call to ask Iris questions. I think what would be nice is if you can introduce yourself to Iris, share a little bit about who you are, what you're up to now, what your goals are, and then you can ask Iris any question that you that you have. Don't be shy, people. Hi, Iris. I'm Sherelle. And um, I've been in coding for like 23 days now, but I love it. It's like what I've always wanted to do. And now I, I switched careers to do it. Uh, so um, I completed like uh, uh, Lambda's pre-course and I also applied to Flatiron. So um, I haven't really worked out where I'm going yet, but um, is going to be within the next month or so. And I will be a successful web developer. So you will. <laughs> Hi, Iris. Um, <clears throat> my name is Chris Warren. Uh, I've actually been accepted to the Lambda School for mobile development. Um, and I, I, start, I start class there in July. Um, so it, how is it um, at MailChimp? How do do they have a lot of mobile developers like doing that, or you know, um, like how do you how do you go about talking to, to companies like that to get them interested in you to to pursue a conversation about employment? 
so uh okay so that's two questions so the first one is um what is mo what what is Mailchimp's like mobile team like, right? Like, well, do do they have a lot of uh, of mobile developers working at Mailchimp, or is yeah. it like kind of a, one of those? Eh, so I'm, I'm pretty sure mobile is a pretty small team. I don't know much about them, um, but my understanding is that it's relatively small, and. Um, yeah, to be honest, I really don't know much about our mobile team. I'm sorry. Um, in terms of how to get a job as a mobile developer, I think the process is pretty similar all around, regardless of what position you're aiming for. Um, I think that one of the benefits of taking the mobile route is I think mobile um, development skills are harder to find. Um, and so I think that um, companies might be more might be more willing to hire junior mobile developers and train them because there are just so few out there. Most people tend to go the like web web dev route. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Hey, everybody. So I have um. Nice to meet you. I have actually two questions too. So my first question is, um, as a double minority, did you find it was a little bit different when you were negotiating a salary? Like, or did you find that you were low balls initially and that you had to negotiate up or was it a pretty fair um, salary to begin with? And then my second question is, I live in Atlanta and so I'm the squad lead for the Atlanta squad. And so I was wondering if you had any uh, resources that you think that I should um, um, give, I can give my squad or any events you think we should go to that you would recommend for people who live in Atlanta? Yeah, so for the first, uh, for the first one, I don't get the sense that I was lowballed um, or that it was related to my race or my gender. I think that as a junior, as someone who's coming straight out of a boot camp, it's your first job. I think in general, you're gonna come in mostly at like the bottom, uh, the, the bottom um, bracket. Um, and so that's definitely where I came in and my offers at both companies were in that like low range. Um, but they were still higher than what a lot of people get at other companies. Um, my offer, my offer from MailChimp was 105. Um, and when you added in my bonus and everything, it was, uh, about a hundred and when you add in my, all of my bonuses for the year, it was about 150. And then I also negotiated a signing bonus, a $20,000 signing bonus. So in total, it was about one seventy. Yeah. Um, which I think is like, I thought was pretty good. Yes. Um, and like, especially as someone who had no, like some people finish a boot camp or they're self-taught and they have like, they, they end up like doing like freelance work or like having like really strong experience that they can go into the process with and they might come in as like a high junior. So within the junior bracket, there's like a range. Um, so you can still have, you can have two or three years of experience and you, you are still hired as a junior. You're just gonna be given a higher, uh, a salary at the top of the like junior tier. Um, so I definitely came in at the bottom. My offer at Reddit was 99,000 and they were not willing to move it up. Um, so I ultimately went with MailChimp, not really because of the salary, but for other things. I did not get the sense that I was being treated differently because of my race or my gender. Okay. Thank you. Um, in terms of, uh, resources in Atlanta, I just moved here. Uh, I am about to hit my, uh, it's almost end of May, right? I'm about to hit my third month. I'm about to be here for almost three months. Um, so I'm still getting to know Atlanta. Um, I'm like relatively unfamiliar. I don't really go anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you a newbie still? I got you. All right. <laughs> Thank you, though. Can, can I'm the sorry, ATL Hannah. people, can the ATL people take Iris no. under their wing and show all the, all the smiles? <laughs> yeah, we can hang out. Y'all, I'm in class. I'm sorry, I got my I have my camera off. I'm in class right now, so I'm gonna have to turn my camera back off again. But okay. I just wanted to ask my question with my face on the camera. <laughs> Thank you so much, too. Mm -hmm. 
Iris, thanks for being transparent too about the numbers. I remember Iris writing to me two or three years ago before she did a bootcamp and she's like, you guys always have bootcamp grads on your podcast, but they never talk about salaries. Can we like actually not like, can we actually speak about it up front? Cause I'm sure it's on everyone's mind. So I appreciate now that you're on the other side of the table, you're very open cause uh, let's be real. It's definitely one of the reasons why people want to learn how to code because they want to provide for themselves and their families. Yeah. So thanks Cyrus. Yeah. It's super important. When I'm writing online, I don't give like specific numbers. Um, I'll just kind of give a range, like low 100s, mid 100s type thing. Um, but I think it's very important to investigate what people's salaries are. Um, and it differs by area. So whatever area you're, you're in, make sure that you talk to people and figure out what they were getting paid when they first started um, and what the, um, you know, what the kind of like uh, trajectory is. Um, at different companies so that when you get your, your, you start getting offers, you have a good sense of whether or not your offer is actually good. Iris, I have a question. Um, my name is Jennifer and I am in the squad leader of Code Code World. We aren't like located in any particular geographic location. We're just a bunch of um, full-time career people looking for a change. So my question is geared towards like the interview process because I've never had to interview for a job. I've been active duty for 18 years. And so there's a fear with one, learning to code and jumping into a new career and two, having to sell myself, something that I've never had to do. So what is the interview process like when you were negotiating between the two companies that you were trying to get in with? Yeah, so, um, so before I talk about the interview process, um, I think it's very important to practice talking about your story. And I know selling yourself can be very uncomfortable, but it's just something that you have to figure out how to do. Um, and so talking with people and meeting people who work in the industry and telling them your story is a good way to practice. And after a while, you'll get more and more comfortable so that when you're finally ready to interview, you, you are comfortable and you've also figured out how to give the best parts of your story in like a really succinct way, you know? Um, in terms of the interview process, the, the general process for most companies is um, you do like a, you'll do like a phone screen with a, you know, with a recruiter. The recruiter will just kind of gauge like who you are, your personality, you know, what, what level you might be coming in at. Um, this is a really important conversation. Um, because the recruiter is essentially the one who decides if they want to take a chance on you or not. And if it's a company that isn't really hiring juniors at the moment, you've basically got to convince that recruiter that you are worth, um, you are worth them, like not following their original plan, you know, which is actually what I did. Um, MailChimp only had, they had just opened their office in Oakland. They only had four, uh, four people in that office, a director and three engineers. They were not planning on hiring any juniors anytime soon. But um, my story was like compelling enough that the recruiter was like, you know what, I really like you. I'm going to talk to the senior director and see if maybe he'd be interested, he'd be um, open to bringing a junior on. Um, and then she was able to set up a conversation with me when, and the and the director, senior director actually, and we had a conversation and then he was the one who gave the okay for me to actually go through the interview process. Um, and I have met, I have heard from a number of people that they had to do that. They applied to like a regular role or even sometimes like a senior role and had to like convince them, convince the recruiter, convince the hiring managers, look, I'm not a senior, but I, I'm, I'm someone worth hiring. And so it's really important to figure out what your story is and what your skills are, what you bring to the table and make that clear throughout your interview process, like every step of the way. Um, the first, the first interview is typically a phone screen with the recruiter. The recruiter will then usually set you up with um, either a technical phone screen or a manager screen. My company does a manager screen first. Um, the manager talks to you and then the manager decides if they want to take you to the next level. Um, 
sometimes it's a, uh, but usually it's a technical phone screen and they'll, uh, you might do some sort of like coding challenge um, online um, while you're on the phone with the, with the interviewer. Um, then usually from there, um, you may have a second technical phone screen or they may just um, take you, send you straight to the onsite. And the on-site is when you go to the actual office location in person and you do a series of interviews. It could be anywhere from three to five, six interviews. It depends on the company. I know when I did mine, it was about five different sessions. Um, I think I had two technical sessions, um, lunch with a, with a, the head of talent, and then like two like non-technical sessions. Um, depending on the company, it can be pretty it can be pretty grueling. Um, it's definitely like a long day and you have to, you know, I, I would say, um, I would say prepare as much as you can read as much as you can about different interview strategies. Um, study as much as you can, um, for the technical portion, look at, use places like Glassdoor, where people will sometimes give, people who've done interviews will sometimes give um, information about what the process was like. And sometimes they give specific questions. So they'll say, oh, I interviewed on Reddit and they asked me these questions. And then from there, you can kind of gauge what types of questions that company asks. So find out as much information as you can about their, pro their process and just study, 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 study. Like, I studied all day, every day um, for a good month and a half before I even started um, doing my first like serious interviews, um, my first technical interviews. Um, and then for the cultural portion, I would say um, that, that part you can't really, I think, prepare for that much. I would just say, um, think about what it means to like communicate well, what it means to problem solve, what it means to collaborate, what it means to, you know, have to deal with like, you know, unforeseen circumstances or changes at your company. A lot of companies do reorgs or they might pull you off your team or like drop your team's project, you know, and um, I think a lot of companies tend to ask questions to gauge how you deal with certain types of situations. So try and think about stuff like that and be prepared to answer those types of questions. Legit, thank you. That was more, way more than what I was expecting, but it's definitely very, very, very helpful. Uh, I appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, I like. I I think. The interview process for engineers is probably one of the hardest processes for any job out there. It's not simple. Um, it's not easy. They definitely put you through the ringer. Um, and so it, it does take a lot of preparation and it's something that you have to take very seriously. Um, I, some people graduate boot camps and they just like try and go straight into the interview process. I took six weeks to just study before I, before I started interviewing. Um, and, and I think it made a big difference for me. Thank you. I, I do appreciate it. I, it, like Timor was saying, the transparency is so helpful because there are a lot of people you can ask these questions to and they'll say, Oh, well, shoot me an email and, you know, for my price or whatever, I can walk you through whatever it is. So again, thank you for the transparency. You're welcome. Hi, Iris. Um, Melanie Harris here. Hi. Uh, I guess I'm supposed to start and say something about me. So I have been coding since I believe February, um, recent grad, uh, MBA, uh, jumped straight into coding right afterwards. Um, leader of FFT squad. My question for you, and thank you for being so personal and so open with all of the, the things that you've shared thus far. Um, can you speak more on that transitional period after boot camp and right before your job, as far as, um, your expectation and your reality, what it really was in your own personal, real uh, opinion of the way it's kind of put on how you can jump from straight from boot camp into uh, a job or like what's, what is it really in your experience? If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I think, I'm sorry, my dog is doing, <laughs> um, I think, um, for me, 
it was definitely a good test of my discipline mm -hmm. um, because I think the during the boot camp it was a lot easier to stay disciplined because you're already in a structured program. Once you finish the boot camp, you are on your own, and it's up to you to create a, a continued learning schedule. You know, it's up to you to say, okay, at this time of the day, I'm going to study algorithms. At this time of the day, I'm going to, um, you know, do architecture um, questions. Of the, you know, like, you know, on certain days, I'm going to um, go and, like, network with people. Like, you have to literally create a full, a, you have to basically almost kind of replicate your own boot camp for yourself. At least that's what I did. And, um, but I knew ahead of time that I was going to need to do that. I had done enough research that it was clear to me that that would be the case. I think what was unexpected was how difficult some of, uh, how difficult algorithms and data structures are. It was just, it was just not easy. And uh, sorry, before I continue, is my dog distracting? Should I like put her outside? No, you're good. It's fine. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so, uh, you, a lot of you have probably heard that data structures and algorithms are like a big part of the technical interview process, um, at most software, at most tech companies, right? And there's a lot of controversy about whether or not this is even fair, if this is like a good way to approach interviews, but that's just how it is. Um, so typically what most people do is they use books like, What's that book called? Um, breaking. Cracking the coding interview. Yeah, cracking the coding interview, which I, 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 I did like, I used that book for a little bit and the problems that they have in that book for me were really, really difficult. And it took a lot of practice to be able to understand things like linked lists and um, you know, all the other data structures, queues and stacks and, uh, binary trees and all that stupid shit that you don't really use once you get a job. Like I've never seen a linked list anywhere in MailChimp's code base. Um, and so it's not, it's not stuff that's like practical to learn. It's not stuff that most people are going to end up actually having to use, but you have to try and understand it in order to get through these interviews. It's really bizarre. I think the only places where they use stuff like this are very specific teams at very specific companies, like somewhere like Uber, like certain teams at Uber, yes, they're using graphs and they're using binary, uh, sorry, they're using, um, what are those called, the, uh, trees? I don't even remember anymore. Yeah, binary trees. Binary trees. Like yeah, Uber is like one of those special places where they'll use that type of data structure. Star, no. No, move. She said she wants some attention too. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you look into Uber, like if you look at like Uber, um, um, like a question about like, how would you design like an Uber app? Uber app. That's like an architecture question, which at some companies they ask you architecture questions where you don't actually code anything, but you basically have to kind of like map out how you would structure an application. Mm -hmm. And so a common question is how would you build an Uber app? And so when I was looking into that, I, I learned that they actually use graphs and trees to be able to figure estimate, you know, ETAs and pat, you know, routes and shit like that for Uber. But you 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 would have to be on a very specific team at Uber Uber to even use that type of data structure. But you're very likely to be asked a a a, a, a binary tree or or graph question in your interview process at certain companies. I was definitely asked it a number of times. There were some times where I bombed. I had no idea what the answer was and I had to kind of like bullshit my way through it. There were some questions where like I kind of was able to, it was basic enough that I was kind of able to figure it out. Um, but the studying portion for that was definitely not easy. And there were times where I was really frustrated and I was really, uh, uh, I, I was questioning my intelligence and my abilities 
And um, it was, it helped me to reach out and ask for help. I actually had a friend from college, not even like a friend friend, but you know, just someone who had went to, who was in my, who went to, who I went to school with. And he worked at Google and I reached out to him and we met and he like went over some stuff with me. Um, I also had reached out to a mentor from my program and we had sat down and went over some questions as well. So I definitely, uh, I definitely like needed help at times um, going over certain types of, um, certain types of problems. Would you say that you were actually uh, prepared? Do you think your boot camp prepared you enough for the job? Or do you think that there was like maybe something that didn't quite click and you had to do more studying outside of it? Or um, I think that what boot camps do is they prepare you to, they try and teach you kind of like the basics of app development. Mm -hmm. And they mostly try and teach you kind of how to think and how to approach problem solving. I would say that's the most important part because at the end of the day, whatever company you end up at, you're not necessarily going to be learning the same language or the same, um, you know, architecture or the same, you know, every, things are going to be very different because every company has completely different processes and structures. You could be working in Python, you could be working in JavaScript, you could be working in Ruby, you could be working in all sorts of things. And so it's difficult for a boot camp to prepare you perfectly for a job. It's just impossible. Um, so what they're going to try and teach you is how to approach learning, how to approach problem solving so that you can be successful in whatever environment you end up in. I think in that sense, they did a really great job. I think when it comes to data structures and algorithms and preparing us for the actual technical portion of the interviews, I think that's where the boot camp was very weak. And I, but my understanding is that most boot camps are kind of like that and they kind of expect you to just kind of study that on your own. Thank you. Um, yeah. Do you have any other questions about, cause I feel like there's so much that happens when you graduate. Um, so if you have more questions about that. Iris, uh, can you talk about rejection? Like how do you get yourself through that? Um, you definitely, you just have to expect it. You have to know that it's going to happen. Um, and, um, just know that like, it doesn't mean that you are not like capable or not worthy of a job, um, or that you can't do it, you know, like it's definitely just a part of the process. Um, I think the hardest part is getting rejected after a technical interview because you put so much effort into the technical portion. And so, um, but there were some, there were some companies where there were like one or two companies where they gave me like a coding problem. And I was like, I don't even know how to do this. And I can't like, I just don't know. <laughs> and, and I just, I, I essentially kind of just dropped out of the process. I didn't even, I actually had a referral to Google. I didn't even bother to go through Google's process because I knew that their questions were going to be way too, way too complicated for me. And um, I just wasn't really interested in doing the work to figure all that out just so I could have a job at Google. Um, so I think you also have to kind of adjust your expectations and know that you're not necessarily, you're not going to get a job straight out the gate at Facebook or Uber or, you know, like it's very, very unlikely. Um, unless you have some sort of background already in like science or math or, you know, and you kind of have like uh, a knack um, for that type of like really complex uh, logical, I don't know, stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just rejection is just a part of the process. And honestly, you're going to have a lot of moments in your career where you feel like shit. So just be prepared for that, too. <laughs> I'm going through that right now. I was put on a new team. Um, we're doing stuff that is very new to me. And I'm, you know, I had just started to feel kind of competent on my old team. And then now I'm put on a new team. I have to learn all this new stuff all over again. I feel like I feel like I, I feel like I just started you know? Um, and so, I mean, this isn't rejection, but it's like, you're gonna, there's going to be a lot of moments where you kind of question yourself and you just have to not dwell on it. Like, don't dwell on it. 
think about it for five minutes and then move on. Yeah, Iris, I got a question. Um, to kind of extend off of what Melody was asking, the expectation versus the reality of when you started your first job, what you expected would be asked of you as far as the actual job versus what it ended up kind of being like. Like, I hear a lot of people say that they start a new job and everything they've learned is kind of off, out the window. They want to teach you their way of doing stuff or they don't expect you to, there's like a learning curve time where they expect to give you time to get used to how they do stuff and what they're using. How did that work out uh, with your job? I'm Craig, by the way, sorry. Hi, Craig. Uh, so my company is actually pretty, they have a pretty great onboarding process. I don't know how common this is, but they assume regardless of whatever level you're at, whether you're junior, mid-level, senior, whatever, they assume that it's going to take you some time to get up to speed and they don't want you to be stressed out working crazy hours, trying to figure out how to get up to speed. So when I first started, my manager was like, you're not expected to ship any code for the first three months. Um, so yeah, so I had about three months to, um, well, first I spent, I, now, I don't know how common this is, but I spent, my first few weeks, literally just spending time with my coworkers. Um, I did a lot of one-on-ones. I was encouraged to just like meet with people in different departments. Um, my manager felt, I also have a really great manager, but he was like, you know, social capital is really important. Having relationships with people in the company is really important. Understanding how different, how the different teams work and how they work together is really important. So I was able to spend a lot of my time just doing one-on-ones with my coworkers and getting to know them, sitting in on meetings for my team, and just kind of getting a sense of like the flow of things. Um, and then my first project was to basically write up like a, some documentation on my team's um, system. Um, because, sorry, uh, sorry, I'm getting a phone call. Give me one second. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I had to write some documentation up for my team, um, which meant figuring out how the arc. So I was working on a team that was building like a new product that was separate from the MailChimp app. So I had to figure out, okay, how does this whole thing work? What does the system, the architecture look like? Um, which meant going through the code, but also I'm looking at this code base. I have no idea what it says. I don't even, I don't even know PHP. Right. I learned Ruby in my boot camp and we use PHP at MailChimp. So I had to spend a lot of time meeting with different people on the team and having them go over different sections with me and writing, you know, trying just trying to just put it all together in one document. Um, and then from there, I was able to then take on like a very, very, very small scope ticket to kind of like practice a little bit. And then from there, they just started giving me um, slightly more and more complicated tickets. So I wasn't really shipping code until, yeah, I hit my third month. Um, and then from there it was kind of, you know, just continued to, to, to develop. Um, I don't know how common that is. I think it, that tends to be more common at companies that are, um, that are more, uh, that are more comfortable. Um, that don't have a lot of like pressure. Um, so I, I think if you're at a small startup, if you're at a bootstrap startup, if you're at a startup that's like really trying to meet like very specific numbers or else they might like lose funding or shut down, you know, like I think if there's a lot more pressure to jump in and like start contributing right away. And so that's another thing that you have to think about is that being at a very small startup is going to be a very different experience than being at a larger established and profitable company. It's very different. Startup, the startup environment is a lot more, uh, typically a lot more intense and a lot more, um, a lot more like high pressure. Thank you. Um, hello, hi, Riz. My name is Ayo, mm -hmm. and uh, I've been coding for the past 16 years. 
but majorly I write Java, C sharp. Those are my languages that I really work on. I actually started as a mechanical engineer. That's where I got my first and second degree. That's amazing. Before I decided to switch over to IT. And uh, I've been doing this for a very long time. But one thing that I, that I discovered about this boot camp is uh, mainly most of the languages that they're teaching is Python, Ruby, PHP. So I'm kind of wondering, is there any boot camp that teaches Java or C Sharp? I know, I know C Sharp is for Microsoft. I understand that and uh, probably they may, we might not have boot camps trying to train you in that line alone. So is there any boot camp that's majorly training people on Java? That's my first question. Then the second question is that, uh, I don't know if you understand anything about Java, but what I understand about uh, programming is that if you understand the logic or the concept of object-oriented programming languages, you should be able to pick up the syntax and gradually start learning the APIs and know how to put things together. So I want to know, is it, is it the same concept that you use in Java or C Sharp? Is it the same concept that they use in uh, Ruby, PHP, Python, and all those object-oriented programming languages? Yeah, so my understanding is yes. They are all very similar. Um, they have different levels of complexity. Um, I think Java and C, C++, C Sharp, et cetera, are their older languages and their um, harder languages, from my understanding, they're harder to learn. Um, the newer languages like Python and Ruby are just a lot more kind of user friendly. There's a lot more like frameworks and things like that that kind of um, help you to write the code um, or basically kind of simplify um, the code. So, you know, something that might take Correct me if I'm wrong, Timur, but something that might take two or three lines to write in like Java, um, you could write in like less lines. Um, in something like Ruby, there's more like built-in built in methods. Um, but my understanding is that overall, they are very similar in terms of logic. And so, um, you know, once you know one language, you should be able to learn any language. And some companies are very specific about coming and knowing a particular language. My company in particular doesn't even hire based on language. We expect you to be able to learn no matter what background you come from. We expect you to be able to learn um, a coding language, uh, for the coding language for whatever team you're placed on. Um, because, you know, you should be able to, as an engineer, you should be able to learn new languages relatively quickly. And you should be able to eventually, once you're at a certain level in your career, you should be able to read code in a language that you don't even know and still be able to grasp generally what it's doing. Um, in terms of boot camps that teach Java, I have no, I've never seen, a, I've never seen one, but someone said in a comment that Lambda is teaching Java. Um, Timor might know more about this than me. I guess my uh, question to you would be, uh, Conley, what is your goal? Because uh, like what Iris was saying in terms of getting a job, uh, it's just a, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of learning how to build applications, whether it's web apps, Android apps, iOS apps, and building your portfolio and getting ready for the whiteboarding problems that you'll get asked in interviews. Um, a lot of the time, you just need to just grasp those concepts versus just knowing a specific language. And so I wouldn't pick a bootcamp based on whether they teach Python, Ruby, or JavaScript. I would just pick a bootcamp that has like the schedule that works for my schedule, financing options that work for my option, based on outcomes, other factors that come into play. But I wouldn't stress about, um, with your experience, you're already coming in ahead of everyone else. So if anything, you already have a leg up over anyone doesn't matter which program you start. So, 
Yeah, th thank you, too. More probably yeah. we'll have to talk more about that later after the meeting. Uh, and uh, yeah. one of the reasons why I'm asking this is, is because, uh, you know, I've worked on uh, a lot of projects and I have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of projects that I can showcase to anybody at any time. But uh, I realize that what is really going on right now is more of uh, people trying to code in so many languages and trying to expand their territory. Probably maybe that will give you more chance or more privilege when you're trying to look for a job. Uh, maybe I should mention this that I just moved over here from Africa. I've been working in Africa for a very long time. Um, I'm just two years in the States here. So, so and... Uh, Things are a little bit off. I've been doing freelance since I came for the past two years, and it's 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 still okay. I'm good. I'm good with what I'm doing. I love what I'm doing, and I do it with passion. So, a friend introduced me to Career Camera, and he told me that oh, they have all these good stuff, and I have to appreciate you guys that you guys are really doing a good job. And uh, one of the things that I love about the Rare Karma is that it gives me the opportunity to give back to people, to teach people, bring people up, show people uh, the best way to go around their coding and uh, all those stuff. I love that. So uh, maybe most of my questions is not for this meeting. It's for half of the meeting. So yeah, I'll, and we can, we can schedule... Uh, Aya, we can schedule a time uh, offline and we can chat specifically about your case uh, as well. Oh, all right. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. By the way, we have about 10 minutes. I want to be respectful of Iris's time because uh, she's on the East Coast. I just had a quick 30. question. Yeah, um, go ahead, Lauren. Because a customer at work asked me about it and um, she does uh psychology and she wanted to know does coding is there like a side of coding that maybe goes with psychology and statistics maybe like is there a side um, of coding that is like you, goes together yeah so there are people who do um there are people who do data science um, and then there are people who do, um, Timor, you might, you might be better at ask, asking this question. Honestly, I, I, I think, um, it, it definitely depends on the person when they're, when someone is starting out, my advice is always start with the free prep course for a school. And if you're interested in design, try the free design prep course. If you're interested in data science, do that too and then if you want to learn how to build apps start with like a web development prep course and very shortly into it you'll see which one you like more and then you just double down and pursue that path um, data science is not like if, if people think web development is difficult data science it adds another dimension to what you're learning because you need to learn how to program and you need to learn you need to learn like specifics of statistics and math and so if you're starting out and you already have and you already know you like math and you like statistics then data science is going to be kind of easier for you because you already have that side of uh kind of the pie chart figured out and now you just need to learn programming if you're starting from scratch and you're just wondering should i be doing data science or should i be doing web development i think learning web development is going to get you into a job faster because you just need to learn how to build web apps and then you can take online courses and do uh, like machine learning data science stuff on your own and teach yourself that but at least you're not overwhelming yourself trying to learn python and some framework for data science so just tell her that data science would be what she would be looking for for us because i did give yeah. her my information I would tell her to join Career Karma and start the 21 day challenge and join your squad and then we'll take over from there. Okay, well I did give her the link and- um, Yeah, I and her give name. her, Lauren, give her your link, your invite link so you also get a wristband when she joins. I did do that. Perfect.
perfect. But do you want me to text her um, anything about data science or just wait? I think once she joins, uh, we'll, we have, we actually explained that on the, in the workshops and uh, 21 day challenge. Um, I think Craig said if, if uh, she's interested in psychology, I guess UX design, yeah. you need to think through like what, what is the user's experience? So they well, that's what she goes to work for is psychology. She's in working. Yeah, that's her career in psychology, and she works in statistics all day in coding at work. Okay, I mean she can, she has a lot of things to she has a lot of options, uh, mm -hmm. and this goes to everyone who's on the call. Uh, just because before this you did some you have some background in some field, it doesn't mean that now you have to limit yourself to learn how to code or to acquire a new tech skill related to finance or related to some other thing you did before. Even though she has uh, psychology experience, there is nothing wrong with learning how to code or learning data science. Uh, yeah, she she'll, be able to combine, she'll be able to combine the two once, once she's in tech. Okay, well, thank you so much. She just wanted me to ask a question and yeah. figure out some information for her. For sure. Um, I have a question. Um, I was just curious um, in regards to I know at the beginning you was talking about some of the things that you were interested in, interested in in regards to philanthropy work. Um, since you made it through and you finally gotten to work, have you branched off in that area at all in regards to? Um, um, I think you said it was so. Uh, I know it was something that you on but but social. Yeah, social justice. Which yes, thank you. I'm going to say, you know, it's very different from philanthropy. I'm not rich. I don't have money to give away. Right, 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 right. <laughs> um, I will be, I will be one day though. Um, but uh, yeah, so I have, I started a company called Organize. Um, that's Organ with the E Y E Z eyes. Um, and our mission is to create tools and content that helps activists be more effective, active, progressive activists and social justice movements. So we have a technology component. Um, we have a bunch of apps that we want to build. We're in the process of building our first app. And we also have an education component. Um, we have um, an online workshop series that we're working on. And we also have a podcast where we interview activists and also researchers about um, strategies or being effective um, as a community organizer or, you know, someone who works on campaigns. Um, and so, yeah, that's like my, that's my main kind of side project right now. And uh, it's going pretty well. I really enjoy it. I have a small team of about six people. Um, and, you know, it's been a very, very committed team. We all do this part time outside of work. Um, but I'm like really looking forward to, um, to like taking, to creating, I'm really looking forward to fulfilling my like original, uh, goal. Yeah. And I apologize. I'm, um, I didn't say it, but I'm Marcus, um, been coding for like two months. Um, but that is part of the reason why I wanted to also, um, get into this area. I actually have a friend that went to jail for creating something that they can't really explain. Um, so he's kind of in jail right now for something they don't, they don't even really know what he's created. Like he created the first actual cryptocurrency bank, but he did it along the lines of trying to help people that was in, in poverty, wanting to be able to help assist people that can't get bank accounts, so on and so forth, so they would have the means to be able to do so. Um, but just in general, I, I just think that's that's one of the goals, like I said, that put me in a place to actually want to be a part of doing the things that we're doing, especially for our culture, to be able to move into tech, because that's where I, I believe personally we're one of the places that we lack um, in understanding to be able to move and make sure we stay ahead with the time. So I definitely commend you for that. Thank you. And I think something for everybody to think about or something that I, I like to encourage people to think about is like as you move through your work um, and as you learn more about technology, you're also going to be seeing a lot of things happening in the world. And there's a lot of ways that we can address um, problems, maybe not fix them all together, but make things better through technology. 
There's really cool companies out there that are building really cool technologies. One example, one company that I interviewed with was called Binti, and they create adoption software. And what they found is that 90% of people drop out of the adoption process because it's just too unorganized. Um, Caseworkers just have too many um, people to deal with. They don't have effective systems for managing it. Um, and so parents just drop out because it's just, it's just ridiculous. And so this software basically allows uh, potential adoptive parents to do their entire um, like sign up process online. And then the app allows the case managers to track all of their parents. And it reduces a lot of like repetitive work before everything was being done like via paper. You know, and then you might spill out a form, you go and you submit the form. And then two weeks later, they're like, we don't know where your form is because you got to do it again. Um, And so this software has like increased, like drastically increased the amount of kids that are getting adopted in the counties that have actually signed up to use this service. So they they basically work with the government. The government pays them for this service. Um, And so there's lots of companies out there that are starting to get into this type of work that solves like a really important people, human, like person problem. And I would definitely look at those types of companies if you're interested in doing like work that like, if you're interested in working on technology that like really impacts people's lives, um, those types of companies do exist, but they're hard to find. So you don't have to ask around. I found that one on accident. I was, I did an interview with Eventbrite and the manager, like I didn't get the, I didn't make it through the interview, but the manager was like, I, based on your interest, I think this company, um, I have a friend who works at this company and I think it would be great for you and they recommended you. So like if that, if, if social justice or, you know, environmentalism, like those types of things are your interest, like make that clear so that people can kind of guide you in that direction. And also, and also just as you're, as you're just going through your career, like just try and think about how you could solve problems using technology. And when you come up with that idea, like take it seriously, you know, like pitch it to someone, start a business. Career Karma is a great example of something that's addressing like a really big problem and is going to change a lot of people's lives. Thank you. It sounds like it's uh, blockchain based. Binti, the app I mentioned. Yeah, most a lot of the companies that's coming out now that are like um, really in that area of trying to help solve real world problems. Blockchain is one of the biggest systems right now that that's really does, it, especially with smart contracts and stuff of that nature. So, mm-hmm. but I saw somebody else had a question, so I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I was just jumping in, or you know, family Morgan, come on. Hey, Iris. Hi. <laughs> um, I know I sent you a a nice little bio. Um, previously in regards to writing and, and um, contributing to the CK app. But I just want to say that I appreciate everything that you just shared with us tonight. I really wanted to highlight a point that you brought up um, pertaining to the interview process. I think the way that we structured Barcode Avengers and Barcode New Yorkers is assisting in that in that manner because the way that we we've actually – checked in on each person with those one-on-ones that you mentioned um we just created that amongst like five of us it was like how we how do we get you know people involved with one another and then we just kind of created that mindset of people reaching out one-on-one and so we set a you know structure and a, a schedule a deadline for everyone to meet that and i so i really want to shout us out because the way that we're structuring our our squad it will eventually help each one of us um, succeed in that interview process because we wake up every day and treat our squad as its own little business in a sense because we, you know, we're working on our, our pre-coursework. We're, we're defeating these challenges. We're entering these, these boot camps and then we're checking in on one another. So it's the strategy behind what we're doing. I think you highlighted it in a way where I didn't even have to ask the question. So shout outs to um what we got going on at CK. It's it's really a a, a major influence in my life. I got my daughter coding right now. She's a young um Avenger. And um man, we just gonna go for it. I'm not gonna stop. I'm not looking back. Um it's so much to learn. I'm really understanding from everyone that 
gets involved with um, coming in to speak with us, that it's just an effort of working really hard and reading, applying the knowledge, and then seeking a network. It's just connecting yourself to the right minds and the right people and the right umbrella of how you're going to succeed in this industry. So as far as culture and everything like that, I, honestly, this is global. You know, um, this is a, a global situation. Shout out to Ao, man. I, I, what cult? What? Where you at? <laughs> like, I need to know you. <laughs> I'm in Atlanta. Yes, <laughs> hit me up. I'm on CK. <laughs> Where? Um, but this is a real international thing, and I just want to shout everybody out individually, man, because everybody is pushing forward. I see the, I see the structure. I see the effort. I see the team. Um, Unionship, I just see everybody really, really supporting one another day in, day out, uh, around the clock. It's just a, it's an excitement um, to really feel and experience and take in myself. I've been coding, I guess, all my life because I've been, I've been behind a computer. You know what I mean? But um, as far as understanding code, man, I wouldn't have understood it completely if it wasn't for CK. So I appreciate the, the coaches over there, Timor, Ruben, and Archer, because I've seen code in my life, but I never really paid attention until you guys said, hey, you need to learn this. So thank you once again. And um, shout out to my team. We're doing great things. Um, shout out to every last one of you guys who are participating in CK. Love you guys. Let's break in. I know. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for tuning in. Iris, um, you as well. This is definitely – I appreciate you being transparent. This is definitely a special treat uh, to everyone who's on the on the call. Um, in terms of, I'll ask you the, one last closing question. In terms of kind of your path in your life, do you feel like if you had to go back to, um, I don't know, like three years ago or four years ago when you were just hearing about coding boot camps, hearing about jobs in tech, uh, would you do it again? Oh, absolutely. I would do it all over again. There isn't really anything I would do differently. Um, yeah. I wish right. I did as a kid. I mean, yeah, I, I do wish that I had exposure to um, tech to STEM and more exposure to STEM at a younger age. Um, mm -hmm. I do wish that, but, you know, I am grateful for the life that I've lived and the experiences that I've had. Yeah. Yeah, what can we expect one last, from one last question. Oh yeah, go ahead. No, I was just gonna ask what's your what's your schedule like in general? Work hours. Um so we have a we have a lot of flexibility with setting our own hours. I prefer I'm not a morning person, so I go in at ten and I work till about six. There are some days where I will go in a little earlier, like like if I know I have to do something in the evening, I will go in earlier so I can leave earlier. Um, but it's generally about 10 to six. I don't, work, I don't work more than 40 hours a week. And we're, talking, we're not really allowed to. If you do like it, you know, your, your manager will say something. Cool. Iris, one last question. So what can we expect from you um, in the next five, five, 10 years? I know this is, this is only the beginning. What are some of your goals, ambitions, just so you can find other people who are on the call who might be interested in supporting you and your in your goals? Yeah. So my company, we're we're gonna actually turn it into a nonprofit so that we can start raising some grant money, foundation money. We found a, a professional uh, fundraiser who's gonna be working with us. Um, so our goal is to really kind of expand and take the capital that we get from these grants and um, and be able to like properly compensate our staff. Um, our goal is to help people all over the world, activists all over the world, make like really radical change um, in their local communities, state state governments, national governments, etc. Um, we want to play a role in like shifting shifting the world towards you know equality, um, peace, justice all of that. And I think in order for that to happen, activists need to be trained and they need to have tools. And so that's what our focus is on. Um, in terms of like personally, um, I want to be rich. And so 
<laughs> my job, my job is like helping me in some ways, but I'm also starting a business on the side. I'm, I'm getting into investing. Um, and you know, I, I plan for that to really be able to kind of take me to the next level. I can't really say too much about it, but, um, but maybe later on down the road, you know, once I'm a millionaire in like two years, you know, y'all can, I'll tell I'll tell you what I did. <laughs> All right. I like that. Awesome. Well, awesome, Iris. Well, great seeing you tonight. Um, let's all give uh, Iris a round of applause. Woo! Iris, amazing job. Um, always a pleasure. Uh, for people who do want to write for the publication and start sharing their stories, uh, reach out to Iris and uh, she can help you uh, become a contributor. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks a lot, Iris. Have a good night, everyone. Say bye Have to Star. Good. Thank you. Bye, Peace. Star. Bye, Star. <laughs> I'll see y'all later. Thanks bye so much, everyone. Iris. Bye, bye.